Chris, I got to tell you, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. Everywhere I look today, in whether it's it's Energy Press or the Wall Street Journal or or any of the popular press, or even on TV, they're talking about data center energy usage, sustainability, the impact of AI on on sustainability. And it's just such an incredibly popular topic right now. I can't think of a better person to help us sort out the reality of those discussions from the rhetoric. So just to start off, as the Chief Technology Officer for Digital Reality, you you help lead um, a, a global, one of the largest global providers of cloud and digital data center solutions with more than 300 data centers across six continents in 25 countries and 50 metro areas, which is incredible span. Tell us a little bit more about the services you provide to your customers and the value proposition that you make available for them. Absolutely, Casey, and I uh, appreciate being here. Very exciting uh, times, to say the least, where data centers are at the epicenter of our personal lives, our professional lives, and you know, just really what we've been doing. Um, Digital Realty has been around for about 20 years now. This is our 20th anniversary. I've been there um, coming on nine years. And so what we do is we provide... Uh, kind of uh, what I would say is the real estate, which ultimately then entails a data center being built on that and delivering power. And so most of the time, which is why the ESG topic is so important to us, is the ability for us to provide this power to our customers. So one other metric that may be interesting to our audience is today we provide 2.5 gigawatts of power to our customers, which represents about 2.2 million homes. And so the growth of this is exponential, which to your point with artificial intelligence coming into light, where we have three gigawatts of future capacity, which if you read the certain stats that are out in the press today, artificial intelligence needs that and more. And so the core value of what we've been delivering to our customers is steady, reliable power in a very efficient fashion all around the globe. So when you build a new data center, how much power is it taking typically? It depends. They come in different shapes and forms. Yeah. Um, we have a single facility inside of Ashburn, Virginia, where it's about a million square feet. Mm -hmm. um, that represents 100 megawatts. But what's happening in the industry today is the densification of their infrastructure. So artificial intelligence is the, the tip of the spear, where you can do a lot more within a smaller square footage. But that power requirement is definitely jumping up. So for perspective, a 100 megawatt facility data center, that's about 80,000 homes. So that's putting in a new town yes. in a year or two, yes. right? So the complications of building the capacity for that, not just electricity, but everything else you need is, is enormous. So I, I know that uh, digital reality has been committed to sustainability and you've set pretty aggressive goals. Um, tell us a little bit about how you think about those goals, what the journey has been like for you and, and what are some of the business drivers that lead you to to, to pursue those goals. Absolutely, Casey. And one of the things we've looked at about 15 years ago, we brought our first green data center to market. And I think, you know, one of the things that drove us is not only just being efficient um, on our customers' behalf, but also understanding some of the limitations of the market, which you had referenced, where these uh, capacity blocks of power, I mean, they represent a substantial impact, not only to the community, but the overall utility grid. What's been driving us around that in, you know, 10 years ago, we really started our, our kind of ESG program and how we brought that to market. It's just around efficiencies and being good stewards of, you know, the resources we're, you know, procuring on our customer's behalf and making sure that evolves. But there was kind of a couple of key drivers, demand being one of them, because of the amount of capacity we're talking about in power, and it's also critical as water as well. Mm -hmm. So being able to understand that demand profile and being good uh, stewards of you know how to interoperate with the community and the overall utility grid, just finding those operational efficiencies on our customer's behalf. Because one of the things that we've grown up through the years in our heritage, hyperscalers. So you name the major cloud operator, right. we've been serving them for many, many years. So we've seen a lot of this demand coming to market, but finding those efficiencies in, in you know, not only on power, and as I referenced water, mm -hmm. that's a top of mind for us. So being able to align to those goals and understanding the demand profile that was coming at us was a key driver in allowing us to do that. So it, it's uh, it's an interesting jigsaw that that you uh, uh, that you have to solve for. Um but you mentioned the hyperscalers and your customers, they're demanding cleaner, um, not just electricity, but cleaner operations in general. 
how upfront are they? How how much do they press when they're entering into contracts with you that, that that's a priority for them? No, absolutely. It's top of mind. And it's top of mind not only to the hyperscalers, but our broader 5,000 plus customers where our complete kind of ESG profile is an important element in doing business with us. And so, you know, we talk about PUEs in the industry. The most simplistic sense is it's like miles per gallon in mm-hmm. your car. Like every kilowatt we take, how much actually goes to the, actual, the infrastructure and the facility but it's the WE as well, the water usage, like how much water you're bringing in to cool these facilities. And mm-hmm. there's different technological uh, ideations that have been happening for some time now. And with the advent of artificial intelligence, liquid's coming more into play. Mm. And so being able to deliver liquid to the, fa- to the facility and then ultimately to the customer in different fashions is something that is required to find further efficiencies. So one of the things is, Liquid is 800 times denser than air. Mm -hmm. And so in that simple uh, step function, we're able to really cool in a more efficient fashion our customers' infrastructure. So that operational efficiency is one element of it where mm-hmm. because we take a, you know this power from the grid, we're able to deliver that effectively. But also to your, to your question, the broader capabilities around is it coming into the conversation on, you know, how are you utilizing water and how are your broader goals being met? It's absolutely top of mind and it's a core component, not only when we sign the initial contract, but then how we're performing overall. And so that's why our ESG report is listed on our website and you'll see constant updates, but um, you'll see a lot of these new updated metrics coming to light. Yeah, and I think what's critical in that discussion, there's no regulations forcing you to do right. this. The states or the federal government, whoever, Maybe in different countries, right? There are yeah. some regulations, but this is customer driven. And that's, you know, that's an important distinction because it's not regulatorily driven in most cases. And uh, that probably means it more, more staying power to these initiatives. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, you'd mentioned um, AI and specifically generative AI really having a big impact on your business. Before we sort of dive into the sustainability impact of Gen AI, from business perspective, how is it impacting your business and where do you see your business heading because of these uh, technology changes? Yeah, and uh, absolutely. So generative AI is definitely the key topic that we hear a lot about. We read a lot in the press. Um, one of the things that it's doing for our business is the supply to demand imbalance. So there's a tremendous amount of demand and the amount of power required for some of these new models coming to market is mm-hmm. definitely putting pressure on the industry, not only you know, data centers, but also the utilities. It's just the overall supply chain. Um, what we've been doing for some time now is working with the utility grids and projecting. And I referenced earlier, we have three gigawatts of runway coming to market to quite frankly solve for not only generative AI, but the overall yes. market. Um, it's, it's absolutely top of mind for us to keep that balance with the customer and with the overall utility because there's not going to be enough at the end of the day. And so that's what's really a key driver in our business going forward. And one of the stats that, uh, that I've seen is that an AI query uses 10 times the power of traditional search query. Now, I'm sure that curve is going to bend yeah. and new generations of, of AI-enabled microprocessors will be more energy efficient. But the demand is going to go up as well as more and more uh, businesses, people, governments start using Gen AI as part of their core processes. So it's uh, you're kind of on a treadmill chasing that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just another point to add to that, right, where we're in the state of augmentation with AI. Mm-hmm. Right where our tasks are being augmented, our emails are being augmented. I think the yeah. next you know six to eight months, you'll see true you know purpose built AI applications, mm-hmm. which will further drive a different type of outcome. But yeah, traditional search is definitely different today, and yeah. that's impacting our customers. But you know, I think for the consumer, I think it's also being more embedded in how we naturally live our day to day lives. So. You mentioned the the backlog of electricity usage that you need. How are you thinking about getting that energy usage? And and you have parameters in terms of reliability, in terms of carbon content. How what are the different um, tools in your your toolkit to try and obtain that uh, that amount of power? Because you need it, and our economy needs it to keep expanding using these technologies. Yeah, it's one of the things I, I referenced. Uh, Digital has been around for 20 years and mm-hmm. we've been operating at a large scale and being good, you know, 
stewards of the power they would get from the utility grids and continuing to work with them. Like one of the things that really distinctly puts us apart and the industry apart is master planning. So when we go into a location, we want to, you know, talk and, and, and work with the, the, the local, you know, community, the local resources and establish a plan around a campus. And so in that campus, we're very discreet in projecting out multi-year demand profiles around power, around water, and exactly how we're building out multiple data centers within that campus that's really allowed us to work you know extensively with the utility providers but then you know even that is coming under uh, constraints right with sometimes generation but most times transmission and so we look at all types of different technologies that are becoming afforded to us some sooner than others but like mm-hmm. small module reactors is one thing we look at and being able to embed you know, a nuclear reactor. So would you constantly. buy and build your own SMR at yeah. one of your data center campuses? That's the things we're right. actively investigating right. now, right? It's yep. the same thing with enhanced geothermal, uh-huh. being able to bring those in proximity, yep. but also natural gas turbines are another thing. So there's multiple technologies coming into focus, but all options are on the table just because of the sheer demand. And then, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot of is that as companies like Digital Realty and others put those resources in, Right. They can be a shared resource back to the grid. So when the community needs power, you have a heat wave, you have a winter storm, whatever, that can be used as as a resource for the broader geographic area and community, which is incredibly valuable and and not just to the utility, but to the whole community, right? Because when there's an outage, it's devastating to the people that live there. No, absolutely. Being able to work with the utility to balance out the grid. I mean, there's a project that we did in Ireland where we were able to take six megawatts of our UPS Mm -hmm. and port that back to the grid. And that represents a 30,000 tons of CO2 annually being saved on that grid alone in Ireland. But you referenced earlier, one of the other things that we do, and I was just in Stockholm and uh, Copenhagen, we do use some of the excess power during Mm -hmm. certain times of the year to power and heat some of the other local places. We also do it in Seattle as well, but Mm -hmm. just being balanced on not only what we're taking and balancing out the peaks of the grid, but then also giving back to the community any excess heat that we may have. And of course, from my perspective, managing that is incredibly complex. So AI algorithms are going to help utilities and and producers like you um, dispatch that power in a way that makes sense. So one last question, Chris. I, a lot of our, our listeners are very focused on climate change reporting, and they are thinking a lot about climate risk. And where are their assets that are subject to uh, weather threats like like storms or sea level changes or extreme heat events that may put excess um, stress on the grid? How do you you know, you need to keep these centers running. How do you think about that when you're planning? Where do I want to site them? What sorts of resiliency assets do I want to put in? It, it's got to be critical for your business. No, absolutely. And, you know, in my position, I get to spend a lot of time with customers. And so, you know, one of the things that we always try to do is demystify all of the technological challenges that exist in, you know, data centers and power and networking. But one of the things we build is a tool called Visualizer, which allows people to visually kind of go into a digital twin, if you will, to understand the placements of our existing facilities, the floodplains associated with them, mm-hmm. the economic condition. I mean, there's just lots of networking pieces that are played into that tool. So aligning to those customers and watching how that operates. But then for our business and future locations, we're constantly looking at where is power being available? Like what is the grid and you know what are the transmission lines associated with that? That's one of the things that helps us pick where these next campuses will be built. And what's nice is we have a long-term view. And I think that's what's great about digital reality is we really look at a market to land and expand a true campus, which allows our customers, both the big and the small, to quite frankly, not worry about that next allocation of capability that's required for them to be successful. So we're always looking at, you know, power, you know, where is it being generated? How is it being (laughs) transmissions lines are delivering it? But then also, you know. What are some of the other, you know, communities that quite frankly could benefit from data centers? Because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, stress that we see in the in the market that we are constantly balancing that out. And some good incentives to put them in the right places and, and both at the state and the federal level. So, well, Chris, it's been a great discussion. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. 